Hey everybody, uh, Matt Haller here from the International Franchise Association, coming to you from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, not in my basement, however, um, on the second level. Um, and I'm joined by my uh, great colleague, uh, Suzanne Beal, if you want to say hi. Hey everybody. Um, I think it was a week before the world changed that I saw you all last, so great to be back with you all. And thanks, uh, Lane and Brad and the whole uh, Springboard crew for uh, letting us join and give a quick 10-minute update about what's going on um, with politics and policy related to the franchise model, uh, we'll quickly cover uh, both the federal and the state issues of most importance and talk a little bit about the election. Um, so, you know, for the last six months uh, since we've been dealing with this unprecedented global pandemic uh, and both the economic and health crisis that it's created, uh, you know, IFA and our government affairs team uh, has, has really pivoted into um, the mode of trying to save so many of your businesses um, and ensuring that the unprecedented amount of uh, support that Congress and the administration um, and some states have been um, spending trying to provide direct relief to uh, small businesses is sort of maximally uh, impacted in the franchise sector. And for those who have been engaged uh, in our work over the years, you know that uh, Congress doesn't always understand the franchise business model. And so what we wanted to do was make sure that they understood um, how the model works and how when they put these government relief programs together, they were going to be able to maximize efficacy of, of, of these programs. And I think by and large, they've done a really good job. Um, and that's because of the engagement of so many of you. Um, and I think it's the, because of the resiliency of, of the franchise business model that we're starting to see our sector you know, do a little bit better than uh, non-franchise businesses. Um, but quickly, we're going to recap what we've done um, with the Paycheck Protection Program uh, back in March and April, we made sure that uh, so-called affiliation rules were waived so that, you know, franchisees across an entire system could apply for loans on an individual uh, lives basis or on a location uh, basis. Um, what we did after that as borrowers started applying for those loans is we spent a lot of time uh, working on improving the amount of the loan funds that could go towards uh, other overhead costs besides just payroll. And that was really the uh, PPP Flexibility Act um, that became law back uh, in late May, early June. Um, you know, as we've moved into the summer um, and now here on the precipice of fall, um, you know, our priorities are uh, for the most affected companies um, companies with greater than 25 or 30 percent revenue declines throughout this pandemic, you know, making sure that they can get a second draw on a PPP loan um, and have access to, you know, longer term government relief programs like the SBA 7A program or uh, other programs that have been uh, proposed like the Restart Act um, or a so-called recovery sector loan. Um, we've also worked, um, it's been a really frustrating issue. Um, that we thought um, would have been dealt with by now, but unfortunately it hasn't. And it has to do with the ability to deduct um, PPP expenses um, on your tax returns. Um, so right now, um, the way that the IRS and the Treasury Department are interpreting uh, the, the, the PPP funds is that anything that they are used for are a taxable expense. So a lot of borrowers are going to be hit with a 20 to 30% tax bill on what was supposed to be uh, you know, a, essentially a government grant if you used it the way that um, the, uh, the program was intended. So we're still working to get that fixed. It's a huge issue um, for uh, really anybody that took out a PPP loan. Uh, and the last thing on the PPP side is trying to simplify the forgiveness process. Um, so many franchisees are, you know, extremely small businesses under $150,000 loans uh, are where we saw most of the activity. And uh, the paperwork burden there um, on both the borrower and the lender side is a, a real challenge. Um, and we're supportive of legislation that would essentially create auto forgiveness um, for uh, those loans under $150,000. Um, last thing I'll mention before I turn it to Suzanne um, to talk about some other issues is, uh, you know, liability protections are extremely important. Um, you know, we've already seen a huge uptick um, in the business community, uh, pushing with trial attorneys, pushing for almost drive-by lawsuits um, related to COVID, both on the uh, consumer side and the employee side. 
um, and with the, such a patchwork and ever-changing uh, regulatory state um, at the city and the state level, um, if franchisors and franchisees are working in good faith to follow those rules um, as they uh, know it um, at the time that they are uh, released, you know, those, uh, those good faith intentions shouldn't um, be used um, in a frivolous way to hold a brand or a franchisee a liable. And so we've been pushing uh, and thank many of you for signing our letters to Congress to ensure that a liability shield could be included uh, in future legislation. So that's a quick sketch of what we've been working on. Thanks again. Hope everybody is safe and healthy um, wherever you are. Um, keep fighting the good fight. Um, there's a chance that Congress could do something on some of these uh, COVID related measures before they leave for the election. Um, but I think as I've been telling everybody, um, don't expect it. Um, be pleasantly surprised at this point. I think it's more likely it could happen um, towards the end of the year, early in 2021. Um, Suzanne, let me throw it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. I'll give two re regulatory updates, two legal updates before we get into post-election analysis and forecasting. On the regulatory side, the last time I met with this group, we did a special session on FASB, ASC 606 accounting rules. Wanted to share a quick piece of information that I got from FASB just yesterday. They do expect to announce their proposal on the simplified accounting standards for private franchisors next week. I don't have the exact date, but be on the lookout for that. There will be a 30 to 60 day comment period and would love to work with this group and Lane and the company to make sure that we're getting as much feedback as possible to make sure that the, the accounting standard is that works the right way for you. Um, another big regulatory um, activity we're going to have this fall and possibly for the long term is the FTC franchise rule. That rule gets um, updated every 10 years. Um, uh, on November 10th, there's going to be a workshop that was just announced by the FTC, and that is more of a dynamic type of um, activity where the regulators can take input, um, and there's a little bit more dialogue and back and forth than the, the written regulatory process. So um, if you've seen some of the activity lately, Commissioner Chopra just on Twitter yesterday called out three specific franchise brands and has been indicating that the pandemic has um, provided a field for franchisors to take advantage of franchisees. Um, so we are having very intimate conversations with the FTC commissioners, their attorneys, and the, and the staff to prepare for this workshop in November 10th. Internally at IFA, we've created a task force of our leadership, the key committee leaders, the key forum leaders, because we wanna take this consensus-based process very seriously. Um, there's probably four areas that we anticipate the FTC to look at. Um, of course, summary disclosures, making the FDD simplified and up, being able to use upgraded technology, but a mandatory item 19s and the possibility of a private right of action, those are all going to be issues that will be discussed. And um, we'd love to hear more about your views on what you'd like to see in an updated FTC franchise rule. But then also, more importantly, anything you might be concerned about. Um, in terms of the two legal updates, I think everybody saw that um, the, in the New York versus Scalia case, um, the joint employer rule at DOL that we worked so hard on that provided franchising with a very narrow um, definition of joint employer that allows you to do corporate social responsibility activities or anything reasonable, like offering your franchisee sample resumes, that was invalidated in the Southern District of New York. Um, because IFA and six of our stakeholder partners were interveners in that case, we have the opportunity to um, appeal. Um, we're still waiting to see what DOJ and DOL are going to do, but we have heard signals that they want to defend the rule. And so now we're discussing timing. On AB5, um, another big issue I think everybody saw the California legislature closed and we did not, uh, we were not successful on our franchising fix to that statute. Um, I think, you know, what we've seen over the last year that organized labor um, will never let us get that fix. So we're discussing um, a legal complaint right now within our membership that would basically argue that California AB5 is preempted by federal law. In franchising case, the franchising's case, we've got two federal laws we can point to that require actually substantial control over your franchisees, and that's the FTC franchise rule and the Lanham Act. We're very excited um, to report that 
in Massachusetts, there was a district case just two weeks ago um, where 7-Eleven won a case, a misclassification case on that same preemption argument. So um, I think that, you know, more to be more to come on AP5. That fight is definitely not over. And we're looking for support because that is going to be one of the biggest campaigns that IFA and the association has taken on in the legal space. Um, and Matt, kick it back to you for the election update. Thanks, Suzanne. So yeah, just to close for a minute or two on, you know, we're 50-ish days out from the election and obviously a uh, lot on the, on the, at the ballot box to, uh, to be decided, uh, the presidential race, um, balance power in the Senate, House and the state legislatures. Um, I'd say at this point, um, you know, we're very close, similarly situated to where the country was in 2016, where conventional wisdom is that um, Biden's going to win and the Democrats are going to sweep um, the Senate and maintain control of the House, probably increase the number of state legislatures that they control. Um, I personally think the election is much closer um, than that. Um, I think it's certainly a possibility that that situation transpires, um, but I wouldn't go so far at this point to say it's a probability. Um, that being said, IFA has done a deep analysis of what the environment could look like um, in 2021 in Congress and in the states um, if there is a Democratic trifecta. Um, I think the biggest issue that uh, people need to be mindful of is what happens with the filibuster um, in the Senate. This is the rule that requires uh, 60 votes for any uh, legislative movement uh, to, to take place. And if that filibuster is eliminated as Democrats have, some Democrats have said they'd like to do, um, that could mean um, we'd essentially be in a California scenario in Congress where, you know, the minority party in the business community would have little to no ability to stop anything from becoming law, including things like uh, the PRO Act, um, which would codify the joint employer standard and enact a national AB5 like standard, um, along with many other issues like a $15 minimum wage, um, and on down the line. Um, so, you know, that's certainly something to, uh, to worry about um, and be mindful of. Um, that being said, if we do see that scenario, um, there are gonna be some areas of compromise uh, with the Biden campaign that we've already started working on um, and to talk a little bit about that, um, throw it to Suzanne to wrap things up. Thanks, Matt. Um, yep, I, you know, I think what this year has really proven is that franchising is extremely bipartisan in a non-labor space. So, you know, right out of the gate, um, dem the, Joe Biden for president, his campaign platform and the Democratic caucus, there's still a lot to work with them on, um, especially when it comes to COVID relief and recovery. So in his platform, there's a lot of IFA's priorities on, especially with regard to PPP um, 7A loan enhancement so that um, we boost loan guarantees to make it a little easier for lenders to make credit decisions. Um, and that'll provide some long-term relief for our business model. Um, particularly with regard to minority entrepreneurship, there's a lot that we have in common with the campaign. Extra funding for CDFIs that provide lending, um, particularly to underserved communities. Um, IFA is really proud that we're 30.8% minority owned and that's about 12% higher than non-franchise businesses. And we've already started to lay the groundwork um, and just initiated um, the diversity inclusion leadership series. So we have had some engagement with the campaign on that level. Um, apprenticeship training is a universal, a universally bipartisan idea. Um, and I think franchising has got a unique role to play in that debate because we actually train business owners and, you know, we've got a great opportunity to pair with like many organizations in the campaign on um, training of workers, but then future business owners that are gonna hire those workers and get us out of this um, pandemic more quickly. Back to you, Matt. Well, that's all we've got on the issue and the political update. Um, for those who aren't directly engaged with IFA, we'd love for you to join. Um, if you're not um, a member of the Franchise Action Network, um, which is our grassroots um, army out there around the country, uh, you can easily get involved by going to franchiseactionnetwork.com or text FAN, F-A-N, to the number 52886, or uh, Lane and Brad can get you our contact info for any specific questions, or if you'd like to have us do this dog and pony show with your franchisees, we are doing this um, almost every day. So thanks again for having us, Lane and Brad. Um, have a great rest of the conference, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.
Hi, everyone. This is Paul Rocchio at the International Franchise Association. Uh, hope everybody's having a good day. Um, I would like to thank Brad and Lane for giving uh, us the opportunity to address you all at Springboard. Um, I, I'm joined here by my dear friend, Janet Bailey, uh, the chair of IFA's membership committee, and also uh, the president and CEO of FranNet. Uh, she is a longstanding member of IFA and a past, uh, a past board member of IFA as well. Um, so I'm glad to have you here today, Janet. Good to see your face. Thank you, it's good to be seen. So um, uh, we're gonna talk to you a little bit about IFA membership and about some of the upcoming IFA events that are occurring. Um, so uh, for all of you who are not members of IFA, um, you know, granted I'm biased, but uh, if you're involved in franchising, you really need to be a member of IFA. We are the voice of franchising. Uh, you know, everybody in the franchising community, we like to refer, uh, refer to us as the franchise family. Um, and, uh, you know, what we do at IFA, we, uh, we promote, protect, and enhance franchising globally. Uh, we represent franchisors, franchisees, and suppliers. Um, and I'll tell you, especially, uh, especially during uh, this challenging time, the past few months uh, during the pandemic, we, uh, we have really delivered um, uh, some much needed uh, value to the uh, franchising community, um, both on the public policy front, on the communication front, and also on the education front as well. Um, on the public policy front, uh, my colleague, Matt Haller, who oversees our government relations team, you know, Matt and his team were directly responsible for uh, everything that uh, the franchising community benefited from regarding <clears throat> the CARES Act and, you know, PPP funds, everything. Uh, you know, you could thank, you know, Matt and his team for that. Um, and we continue to work on that, uh, you know, throughout the pandemic. Um, and then, of course, you know, communication is key. Uh, we've been, you know, continually communicating with our members, keeping them on top of uh, everything they need to know. Uh, you know, everybody, this is just uncharted waters for all of us. Um, so communication has been key. And then also on the education front, um, we quickly put together uh, a webinar series um, early on in the pandemic and, you know, really, you know, starting in late March through April, you know, and May into June and even, you know, Today, even, uh, you know, we were doing uh, the high point uh, three webinars a day, um, but on all different aspects, uh, you, know, uh, you know, geared towards specific uh, verticals and industries within franchising and, and all, different, uh, all different topics to help educate our members uh, so, they, uh, so they knew how to uh, navigate these uncharted waters. Um, and, uh, and that's what we do at IFA. So it's, uh, again, I'm, I'm biased, but it's, uh, you know, if you're if you're involved in franchising, um, it's very important to uh, to support uh, to support IFA through through your membership because it helps us uh, help you uh, and your franchisees. Um, so on that note, I'd like to turn things over to you, Jana, and uh, and maybe have you talk a little bit about uh, about membership and and uh, so please take it away. Thanks, Paul. As chair of membership, I better be able to talk about it. So <laughs> we are so excited to offer you some uh, opportunities to join that maybe are a little different than what we would have had in the past. So first of all, for every qualifying franchisor that's participating here at Springboard that is not a member of IFA, you can join for the first year for $1,560, that's over $100 savings. And we're also giving you the opportunity to make monthly payments of only $139. Icing on the cake, you can drop at any time without penalty, but I cannot imagine any of you wanting to drop once you become a member. Exactly. With that, yeah, we're going to talk about some of the upcoming events that you do not want to miss. And the first one I'll tell you about is the Marketing Operations and Development Conference. And that's October the 6th through the 9th. What you need to know about the future of franchise marketing, operations and development, all in one week. And I've had the privilege to being a part of some of the planning for this. And I can tell you, there are some amazing speakers lined up and the content is just unbelievable. Great virtual event. 
Paul, you want to tell us about the second upcoming event? Yes, uh, I'm excited to mention the, uh, the Franchise Expo Online. Um, you know, listen, we're living in a virtual world, but if you are looking uh, to attract some awesome leads, uh, I hope uh, you will participate in uh, the Franchise Expo Online, October 15th through the 30th. Uh, now, this event is produced by MFE Expositions. They are uh, one of our partners. IFA is the main sponsor of all of the uh, expos that they produce. Um, and it's, a, like I said, it's an awesome opportunity uh, to meet to meet leads um, and, and in this virtual world that we're living in. So um, I hope people would take, will take advantage of that. Um, so Jana, why don't you tell us about uh, the next event, our Emerging Franchise Work Conference. Sure, November the 18th and the 19th, mark your calendar for the Emerging Franchise Work Conference. Whether you're trying to kickstart your franchise system or take it to the next level, IFA's Emerging Franchise Conference was designed for entrepreneurs like you. I hope to see you there. Paul? Awesome. And then um, I'd like to just quickly mention to everybody that uh, IFA's, uh, you know, uh, going to be reimagining the convention. Um, uh, it's going to occur throughout the month of February, and, and it's, uh, and it's going to be one of those must-attend events. Um, you know, the entire franchising community will be attending, and you just, you, you don't want to be left out. Um, the dates uh, and programming details will be revealed soon, but um, please stay tuned. It's going to be uh, a must attend event. So um, on that note, um, you know, Brad and Lane, I can't thank you guys enough. And also I just have to thank you guys for this, for this awesome, for this awesome t-shirt. I, I, I love these t-shirts. And, and uh, in fact, you got to tell me where you get these shirts, who your buyer is, because I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to have to just get a bunch of these. Um, but thank you guys, as always. And Jana, thank you. I can't thank you enough. Uh, always a pleasure working with you. Well, Paul and Lane, thank you. And I hope my t-shirt's out in the mailbox. I'm going to have to <laughs> run out and check. So exactly. thanks, everybody. And enjoy Springboard. Yeah, enjoy Springboard, everyone. Take care. <laughs>